Welcome to episode four, A New Hope. I'm Joel, and for the next few minutes, we'll be assessing our single greatest hope for a return to the before COVID era normalcy, vaccines. The questions before us today are whether the vaccines will halt the relentless rise of the COVID empire, or will there be an episode of the revenge of the side effects or COVID strikes back? I hope Lucasfilm doesn't, do you think Lucasfilm will sue us for this? <laughs> today, we hope to address some of the fears, concerns, and questions that people have regarding the new COVID vaccines. Here are some of the top concerns I've heard, that the mRNA vaccines are too new, that they'll alter your DNA, that they haven't been adequately tested for safety, and that because the government is involved, they might really be unsafe. I personally believe that all these are very understandable concerns, especially for those outside the biomedical research community. Having such questions is entirely normal when everything is happening so fast. Here's the good news, and if you take away nothing else from this video, please hear this. The mRNA vaccines are not new untested tech, although this is the first time they've made it all the way through the stages of vaccine development to clinical practice. But before we get into the vaccine's history and safety, let's first see how they work. Viruses consist of an outer protein layer and an inner genetic material. The inner genetic material provides the blueprint to make all the virus's constituent parts. In the very early days of COVID, scientists successfully worked out the genetic blueprint of the novel coronavirus and isolated that short fragment of the blueprint used to build the spike protein. The spike protein is the virus's harpoon. The virus uses it to latch onto and then enter our human cells. Based on previous research into other coronaviruses, the scientists knew that it would be a prime target for the vaccine. We want to train our body's immune systems to identify and neutralize the spike protein, because without it, the SARS coronavirus can't invade our cells and will be eliminated. Now, how do we train our immune systems? First, we put the genetic blueprint for the spike protein into a package so that it can be delivered safely to our cells' doorsteps without being damaged along the way. For the COVID vaccines, there are two types of packaging, lipid coating nanoparticles and harmless viruses called adenoviruses. And yes, now that you ask, these nanoparticles have also been tested for safety and refined over a decade through various pre-human experiments as well as safety studies involving humans. For both types of packaging, they only contain the bare minimum genetic material necessary to make the spike protein. They do not contain the complete blueprint to build the coronavirus or more copies of the viral vector. It's like, instead of giving a factory the plans to build a full car, you only give them the blueprints for the wheels. We administer these blueprint containing packages in the vaccines. Down at the cellular level, the lipid envelope or the viral vector delivers the genetic blueprint to our human cells. Our own cells machinery then uses it to build the spike proteins. And you'll be pleased to hear the genetic blueprint is then disintegrated by our cells natural built-in garbage disposal enzymes. The sight of these spike proteins on the cell surface causes the immune system to ring the alarm bells and mount a response. Part of this response involves the body producing antibodies designed to precisely target the spike protein. Then when a real SARS coronavirus comes along, these antibodies will quickly neutralize the assailant. So that's how the vaccines work. Now back to the track record of mRNA vaccines. They have been in the works for decades. It's like your iPhone. All its tech has been in development years before it shows up in Apple's keynote. See, for example, these papers published in 2018 and 2019, way before the COVID vaccine became a hot button political issue. Here are a few quotes from these papers describing the benefits of mRNA vaccine tech. First, safety. As mRNA is a non-infectious, non-integrating platform, there is no potential risk of infectious or insertional mutagenesis. mRNA is degraded by normal cellular processes. The inherent immunogenicity of the mRNA can be down-modulated to further increase the safety profile. In plain terms, mRNA doesn't infect you and it won't become a part of our genetic makeup. The immune response it triggers can be adjusted to ensure its safety. And after doing its job, the mRNA is thrown into the cell's garbage disposal system the same system that deals with our body's own natural mRNA. So, mRNA vaccine technology is not brand new and untested, and we can all be incredibly grateful to the researchers who dedicated themselves to its research and development years before COVID. Less than a year before COVID began, these authors promised, mRNA vaccines have the potential to streamline vaccine discovery and development and facilitate a rapid response to emerging infectious diseases. That promise has been fulfilled with COVID-19. What about the other delivery system? the viral vector vaccines. Viral vector vaccines have also been in development for decades and have undergone even more extensive preclinical and human testing. 
The Janssen, Johnson & Johnson and the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccines both use an adenovirus as the carrier for the spike protein gene. These adenoviruses are harmless even in normal times, but they have been further incapacitated to be made what's called replication incompetent, meaning they can no longer reproduce and spread. Similarly, they lack the machinery to insert their genetic material into the human genome. For my tech friends out there, it's sort of like you want to fix your Mac computer yourself, only to discover they can only be opened with a proprietary Apple-made screwdriver. Adenovirus-based vaccines boast extensive safety records in humans to back those theoretical claims. For example, the specific adenovirus used by the Janssen Johnson & Johnson vaccine, called human adenovirus type 26, has been observed in more than 110,000 individuals from 49 different clinical trials. Before COVID, the largest source of experience has been the Ebola vaccine program, which has been active for several years, and there were other infectious disease targets as well, as shown here. These vaccines work exactly the same as the vaccine used for COVID. The only difference is the specific genetic blueprint packaged into them. The adenovirus used by the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine has a similar track record of safety. Now, of course, scientists are very conservatively minded people, and they would never be content with prior safety profiles when adapting these vaccine platforms for COVID. The COVID vaccines underwent the same rigorous testing for safety and efficacy as any other drug or vaccine. They were not rushed. So how did they develop them so fast then? First, there have been many tech advances over the past few years enabling this. The mRNA and viral vector platforms allow for rapid adaptation for COVID. They are like 3D printers of vaccines. The same 3D printer can build multiple objects depending on the 3D file you feed it. One day you build dragons and the next day you build lightsabers. Yeah. Second, because COVID is an emergency, the many participants in the vaccine development process form partnerships to streamline the transition between stages. COVID became a top priority project with a huge amount of human and other resources dedicated to it. So for example, when the vaccines were submitted for regulatory approval, the regulators got their best statisticians reviewing the data right away. Third, the various phases of the vaccine development process were streamlined where feasible. Here's how vaccine development usually works. After the preclinical laboratory and animal studies confirm the theoretical safety and efficacy, the vaccine candidate is given to a small number of young, healthy human volunteers. Those volunteers are very closely monitored by both the researchers and an independent safety monitoring committee to ensure no safety issues arise and an expected immune response occurs. This is phase one, the first safety phase. Phase two is like a repeat of phase one, but now with hundreds of volunteers in more age groups. Phase three is where the money is. Tens of thousands of people are randomized to either receive the vaccine candidate or a placebo that does nothing. Because of this placebo comparison group, one can now confidently say whether the vaccine works better than nothing. And one can also ensure that no safety issues arise more frequently in the vaccine group. The speed of this phase depends on how quickly you can enroll volunteers and how common the disease is. Once phase three is a wrap, researchers seek regulatory approval and only after approval does manufacturing begin. As an aside, we can now answer the question that some of you have been asking, why haven't mRNA vaccines previously been approved by the FDA or other regulators if the technology is so good? The answer is really quite simple. There are numerous ongoing and recently completed human trials involving mRNA vaccines for various infectious diseases, such as dengue, fever, Zika, and rabies. But before now, it hasn't made financial or medical sense to move an mRNA vaccine all the way through to the approval process. First, not all the candidate vaccines prove effective. Some fail for many reasons. Then there are financial constraints. Vaccines cost hundreds of millions of dollars to develop, test in full-scale clinical trials, and then submit for approval. And to run the large-scale phase three trials proving effectiveness and safety, you need tens of thousands of participants and a disease that is relatively common. Before committing to that, one needs a compelling health and business reason to do so. COVID has obviously provided just such a reason. Back to how they developed the COVID vaccine so fast. First, because the technology was not new, the preclinical work was largely complete. The next stages were staggered where feasible. For example, phases one and two were designed to be a continuous part of the same study. While phases one and two were underway, they were prepping the logistics for phase three so they could commence as soon as the phase one and two results were in. Once phase three began, manufacturers took a risk and they began production so that if the vaccines proved successful in large trials, the first shipments would be ready. Importantly, the vaccines did successfully clear every phase 
See, for example, this long sequence of publications on the safety of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. What should also reassure you is the number of safety checks in the whole process, which the government plays very little role in. At every stage, there are many sets of eyes scrutinizing the data and the claims made about it. One further trick to speed up phase three was to situate the trials where there were more cases of COVID. The more positive cases occur in your study, the faster you can tell the difference between the vaccine and the placebo. Imagine you were hoping to have 250 cases in the placebo group and up to 50 cases in the vaccine group to show that the vaccine was really better than no vaccine. If you did your study in New Zealand, where they have hardly had any cases, you'd be waiting forever for there to be enough cases in the people you enrolled. By contrast, the COVID vaccine trials were conducted in communities at higher risk of disease, allowing them to collect enough cases in about three months. Now, let's briefly review the results of the trials before asking that all important question, which one should you get? Here I'm showing you what are called the cumulative incidence curves. The y-axis shows how many new cases there are over time, and the x-axis shows the number of days since people received the vaccine. Once the vaccines took effect after about two weeks, we can see that the cases nearly flatlined in the vaccinated. There were hardly any new cases in those who were vaccinated, while the cases continue to rise in the placebo group. The vaccine was doing its job. We see the same picture with the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine and the Moderna vaccine. The Johnson & Johnson trial results will look similar, but they haven't yet published their cumulative incidence graph, otherwise I'd show it here. What all these trials showed was one, they were effective in preventing COVID-19. Two, there weren't any serious safety concerns. And three, that one to two days of flu-like symptoms are to be expected, especially after that second dose, which indicates that the immune system is successfully mounting an immune response. And it wasn't that the researchers weren't looking for serious safety concerns. They were particularly attentive to several issues based on previous experience with other coronavirus vaccines. Importantly, they found no evidence of these issues arising with the COVID vaccines. And even now that the phase three trials are finished, they are still monitoring for any rare safety events that may occur. Now we come to that all important question, which vaccine should you get? The short answer is, whichever is offered to you. Most of the concern that I've heard relates to the AstraZeneca vaccine in comparison with the mRNA vaccines. So that's what I'll focus on here. AstraZeneca's vaccine had a headline 60 to 75% efficacy compared to the mRNA's 95%. But there are good reasons to get the AstraZeneca vaccine anyway, if it's available to you. First, there's a basic principle that you can't readily compare efficacy across separate trials. Such comparisons are susceptible to bias, since there are differences between the trials that may affect the results. So we simply cannot say at this point that one vaccine is better than another. From an individual's perspective, the thing that really counts is avoiding being hospitalized and dying of COVID. If we get sick with a cold for a few days, that doesn't matter as much and the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine has proven very effective at reducing hospitalizations. It isn't truly 100% protective, but the risk is much, much lower than without the vaccine. One thing I'd like to make clear is that none of our COVID vaccines promise 100% protection. What they do is reduce your risk of getting sick, and for those who do get sick, they further reduce the risk of hospitalization and death. The first real-world data on the effectiveness of the vaccines is now emerging, and they are very, very reassuring. This study from England showed similar protective effects from both the AstraZeneca and the Pfizer vaccine in adults over 70. After a single dose, not even the full course, of either vaccine, there was a 60% drop in the number of confirmed COVID-19 cases, and there was an 80% decrease in the number of hospitalizations. What these results also highlight is you have to wait several weeks after your shot to get its protective benefits. So the take home point is that both vaccines are effective at preventing symptomatic disease and at preventing hospitalizations and death in those who do get sick. You're better off getting a single dose of whichever vaccine is offered to you than in waiting for your preferred vaccine. And the more people who think like that, the faster we'll get to herd immunity. A quick word on transmission in asymptomatic cases. The data so far support the idea that the vaccines reduce the number of asymptomatic people who are getting sick and therefore reduce the amount of human-to-human -human transmission. But public health officials are being appropriately cautious in counting on this until more data becomes available. This leads to our final point. If you remember from our first video, our immediate goal isn't to prevent all infection, but to lower the reproductive number, the number of people an infected person infects, to less than one, so case counts will start dropping. 
The more people who are vaccinated with any vaccine, the lower down will push R and the faster the pandemic will subside. A final word about longevity. How long does vaccine immunity last? The short answer is, we don't know yet. The study so far provides strong evidence of protection for at least four to six months. The vaccine designers are closely monitoring this, and the good news is that they are developing booster shots, including booster doses targeting the various variants of concern. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this video was informative and answered some of your questions about how the vaccines were developed, how they work, and how safe and effective they are. Vaccines are obviously a huge topic, so we couldn't cover everything today. If you have any more burning questions for us to cover in future videos, please leave them in the comments and give us a good old thumbs up. And please do subscribe to our channel so we can see you next time.